Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Center of Southwest Studies virtual program this evening or this afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to um, that, that we're going to be able to actually have the 2020 Dwayne Smith Lecture Series in Southwest Studies tonight. We had to uh, postpone this from, um, from a schedule we had in April. And um, so we're very thankful that uh, Steve Friesen is willing to join us virtually today. Um, he's going to be giving us a, a, a wonderful, exciting lecture about the life and legacy of Colorado's most famous resident, Buffalo Bill. So um, before we get started, however, um, we always like to, oh dear, okay. I knew we were gonna have some technical problems. Let's see. Uh, my, huh. I can't get to my next screen. Give me just a second. Let me see if I can figure this out. Uh, it's not letting me go to my next slide. Two. Well, darn. Um, Shelby, try moving down your mouse down to the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Does that do anything? No. Hang on. We'll just we'll get we'll get this figured out. Um, oh wait, there we go. Let's see if that works. There we go. All right, perfect. Thank you, Mike. Mike is our fabulous IT technology person and thank goodness he's here to help us out. So um, we always like to start our lectures and programs with the, our land acknowledgement here at Fort Lewis College. Um, the land we ga gather on today at Fort Lewis College is the ancestral lands and territories of Nuchu Ute, Apache, the Pueblos, Hopi, Zuni, and the Diné Nation. We think it is important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of this land and region have long been told from one dominant perspective without full acknowledgement of the tribes who lived on this land before it was Fort Lewis College. Thank you for your attention and respect in acknowledging this important history. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our members who um, provide the funding that allow us to do our programming. And uh, without our memberships, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to, to do the kind of presentations, um, even though we're doing them virtually in a little different format right now. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you in person at the Center of Southwest Studies when we can start having our in-person lectures again. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Steve here in just a moment after I do a quick introduction. Steve Friesen is the former director of the Buffalo Bill Museum and Grave in Golden, Colorado. He was the director there for 22 years. Um, he just retired a couple of years ago and he and his wife, Montalie Denkin, have a consulting firm and work with museums and and cultural institutions across the country, um, giving them great advice on, on all kinds of aspects of, of museum operations. Steve is known for his extensive knowledge of Buffalo Bill, and um, his publications include Buffalo Bill, Scout, Showman, Visionary, which was published in 2011, and was also a finalist for the Colorado Book Award. A more, and more recently, he published Lakota Performers in Europe, their culture and artifacts that they left behind. And um, I have a copy of that book, a signed copy by Steve, which I'm very proud of. Um, and it's a fabulous book. It's really interesting. And, and the, the photography is just beautiful as well. Um, the other thing he is currently working on, and he might share a little bit about this today, is Galloping Gourmet, Eating and Drinking with Buffalo Bill. So he may have some interesting insights for us on that one. So Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you and I'll be back to visit you in a little bit. 
Well, thank you, Shelby. It's uh, an honor to be with you all today. I had hoped to be present in person. Durango is one of my favorite parts of Colorado. I get there quite a bit, um, but uh, COVID-19 has interrupted a lot of our plans this year, and I'm glad that we're able still to gather through the medium of Zoom uh, this afternoon. So I'm going to just get my screen ready here. I believe you have that screen in front of you now. I want to be buried on Mount Lookout. It's right over Denver. It's pretty up there. According to members of Buffalo Bill's family and friends who gathered at his bedside, these were among his last words as he made his final arrangements. Within hours, William F. Buffalo Bill Cody was dead. Four days later, on January 14, 1917, 25,000 people filed by to see him while he laid in state in Colorado's capital. Then thousands more lined the streets um, as a caisson, which you see here in the photograph, took his casket to a memorial service at the Elks Lodge as he had requested. Cody asked to be buried several months later on Decoration Day, which is the predecessor to today's Memorial Day. At the request of members of the Grand Army of the Republic, his burial on Lookout Mountain was delayed so it would not conflict with the parades they had planned for Decoration Day. Cody, like them, was a Union veteran of the Civil War. They did not want to have to choose between attending the parades or going to his burial service. So on June 3rd, a crowd of close to 11,000 people attended the burial service on Lookout Mountain. After years of wandering the United States and Europe, Buffalo Bill finally had a permanent residence here in Colorado. On top of Lookout Mountain, overlooking the places he loved, the Great Plains to the east and the Rockies to the west. In the 103 years since Buffalo Bill was buried on Lookout Mountain, he has been visited by millions of people from all over the world. Many more than actually saw him in the arena while he was alive. He is arguably the most famous resident of Colorado. So what was it about this man that continues to drive people to his graveside? Let's take a look at his life and his legacy. William F. Buffalo Bill Cody was born in LeClaire, Iowa in 1846. When he was eight years old, his family moved to a farm near Leavenworth, Kansas. There they were on good terms with the local Kickapoo tribe and young Will Cody often played with the Kickapoo Indian children. This early relationship gave him a very positive experience and outlook toward American Indians that he kept throughout his life. Will's father, Isaac, was in favor of the abolition of slavery and was spoke out against allowing slavery in Kansas at a public meeting. A pro-slaver in the crowd jumped on the stage and stabbed him several times, nearly killing him. He survived, but the family went through several years of persecution for their beliefs with continued attempts to kill Isaac and frequent plundering of their farm. Nevertheless, Isaac became a more emphatic supporter of abolition and took part in early political efforts to keep Kansas a free state. Three years after the stabbing, he caught a fever and still weakened from his earlier wounds, he died. The example of his father helped make Will an advocate for equal rights later as he became an adult. After his father died, 11-year-old Will went to work as a messenger boy and herding cattle. Later that year, he took a job as a driver on a wagon train and made the first of many Great Plains crossings. Think of the 11 year olds in your life doing something like that. They had to grow up very quick in those days, particularly once the man of the family, his father passed away and he had to be one of the wage earners. It was on that crossing when he first met Wild Bill Hickok, a man who had become a lifelong friend. When he got home from this trip, he was not content to stay. He later wrote, my restless roaming spirit would not allow me to remain at home very long. He tried his hand at fur trapping, and then when gold was discovered in Colorado, he joined the rush to the Rockies, heading up to the Central City area. Like so many others, he returned home with less money than he started, and he was just 13 at that time. Well, when he got back, he joined the Pony Express in 1860. This is a painting by a Denver painter, Jacob Gogolin, uh, of an encounter between the young Buffalo Bill Cody 
it wasn't Buffalo Bill, between the young Will Cody and Indians while he was writing one day. While Cody did write about it later in his autobiography, autobiography, there's reason to believe it was never really happened. In fact, the whole issue of whether actually Cody was part of the Pony Express has been raised by most, not most, but by many historians. My own research suggests that he did uh, participate in the Pony Express. Alexander Majors, one of the three men who started the Pony Express, said he was a writer, as did some of the other fairly famous writers who partook in the Pony Express. This particular story, however, is dubious. So uh, as far as I know, there were no Indians attacks on Pony Express riders in the areas where Cody rode. Well, motivated by resentment from his family's treatment by the pro-slavers, he became a Jayhawker after the Pony Express days. This was the time of bleeding Kansas, and the Jayhawkers were supposedly raiding the farms of pro-slavers in Missouri in retaliation for raids by them in Kansas. But they were pretty undiscriminating, uh, indiscriminating, and uh, raided many, many farms, and they didn't really know if the owners were pro-slavers or not. When Will's mother found out what he was doing, she said, you, you best better not do that. You're no better than a horse thief and made him quit. Interestingly enough, a few weeks later, the group with which he had been riding was ambushed and most of them were killed. Years later in this photo, that, or in this letter that we see in this photo to a friend, Cody said that, it had not been, that had it not been for his mother, he would have died with his boots on. And he added at the very end, God bless our mothers. During the Civil War, Will served with the 7th Kansas Cavalry and then scouted for the army following the war. In between scouting, Will hunted buffalo to supply meat to the Kansas Pacific Railroad. He was very good at it, so good at it that he got the nickname of Buffalo Bill. This popular poem of the time tells the story. Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill, never missed and never will. Always aims and shoots to kill and the company pays his Buffalo Bill. Incidentally, James Boy Joyce used a portion of this poem in his novel, Ulysses, an interesting place to turn up all the way in Dublin after it started out here in the, in the High Plains. Because of his many crossings of the plains and his rapport with the Indians, Will Cody was hired to scout for the army. His skill as a buffalo hunter came in handy as well, since he also supplied meat for the men. As a scout, he roamed across Western Kansas and Nebraska, as well as Colorado. He quickly gained a reputation as an excellent scout and hunter. Buffalo Bill was charismatic and flamboyant, always willing to talk with reporters who were covering the Indian Wars. His legend grew as newspapers and dime novels carried stories of his exploits. Many of the stories only vaguely resembled any real occurrences, but by the time he was 26, Buffalo Bill was a celebrity. But he was not simply a media celebrity. He, he earned his fame. As a scout, he participated in several important battles and skirmishes on the Great Plains during the Indian Wars. One of those was the Battle of Summit Springs, which took place near Sterling, modern day Sterling. In 1872, he received the Medal of Honor from Congress for a battle in uh, Western Kansas, excuse me, Western Nebraska. And uh, this is that medal. Cody's celebrity led to a career in show business. His first job was in Scouts of the Prairie, a drama written by dime novelist Ned Buntline, who appeared in it with Cody and another well-known scout, Texas Jack Omahundro. Joining them on stage was this lovely lady, Mademoiselle Morlocky, who is credited with introducing the Can-Can to America. The show was a success, although one critic characterized Cody as a good looking fellow, tall and straight as an arrow, but ridiculous as an actor. Other critics noted Cody's manner of charming the audience and the realism that he brought to his performances. Actor or not, Buffalo Bill was a showman. The following season, Cody organized his own troupe, the Buffalo Bill Combination. The troupe show is now called Scouts of the Plains, a bit of a subtlety from the earlier show, Scouts of the Prairie. It included Buffalo Bill, Texas Jack, and Cody's old friend, Wild Bill Hickok. Mademoiselle Morlocky also joined the show, although she's not in this photograph. 
Wild Bill needed the money, but was not very enthusiastic about acting. He thought they were making fools of themselves. Uh, he also liked to go to the saloons in the towns where they performed, where he gambled and got into fights with the locals, which wasn't really very good PR for Buffalo Bill shows. Finally, Cody got in a big argument with him and, quote, and Hickok quit. They did part friends and Hickok headed to Deadwood, South Dakota, where he died a few years later of lead poisoning. That's a bullet in the back of the head. He's buried on Mount Moriah Cemetery in Deadwood. Texas Jack left a couple years later and started his own stage show. By that time, he had married Mademoiselle Marlocki, who was part of his new show. Their life together ended rather abruptly, however, when he caught pneumonia and died while they were performing in Leadville. It's kind of interesting that Lead had something to do with the demise of both Hickok and Omohundro. Texas Jack Omohundro's grave can still be seen in a graveyard outside of Leadville. Actually, Buffalo Bill helped provide funding for grave uh, sites for headstones for both Omohundro and for his old friend Wild Bill. Oops, let me just keep on with that. Cody continued staging a variety of plays for the next decade, appearing all over the United States. In fact, his combination, which you see on this poster here, appeared in Denver from July 21 to 23 and at Central City Opera on July 30 uh, in 1879. That year, he also appeared in Colorado Springs. Well, in 1882, Cody had an idea. Immense success and comparative wealth attained in the profession of showman stimulated me to greater exertion and largely increased my ambition for public favor. Accordingly, I conceived the idea of organizing a large company of Indians, cowboys, Mexican vaqueros, famous writers, and expert lasso throwers with accessories of stagecoach, emigrant wagons, bucking horses, and a herd of buffalo with which to give a realistic entertainment of wildlife on the plains. The wildlife also included a small herd of elk, which were supplied by a friend of his in Fort Collins. So there's a continuing connection between Buffalo Bill and Colorado here, even at the beginning of his show. Well, Cody's idea was a hit. The nation was eager to see live and in person the West they'd been reading about in the newspapers, the magazines, and the dime novels. Millions went to see the show over the next 30 years. The show not only brought Buffalo Bill fame and fortune, it made him one of the best known people of his day. With that as a platform, he was able to speak for causes in which he believed. I wrote my book, Buffalo Bill, Scout Showman Visionary, as an illustrated history of Buffalo Bill, emphasizing his role as a visionary who supported causes with which many of us agree today. It's probably in the Durango Public Library or in the John F. Reed Library at the college. If it's not, it's still available through Amazon and occasionally on eBay. Well, Buffalo Bill was indeed a visionary. Beginning in the 1880s, he spoke out as an advocate for preservation of the buffalo, buffalo and decried their wasteful destruction by hide hunting. Uh, back when he hunted them, he had done so to provide meat for railroad workers and the army. He didn't waste any of them. There were millions of buffalo, Bell, uh, buffalo at the time, and Buffalo Bill only killed several thousand. By the 1880s, that had all changed, and the seemingly endless buffalo, endless buffalo herds were starting to disappear. He also supported the work of Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, speaking out for the preservation of wild spaces. In 1883, he traveled to the Grand Canyon, and you see him here standing near the edge. I think he's second from the right in that picture, and was one of the first to suggest the Grand Canyon be uh, created as some kind of a preserve. He was a big supporter of Yellowstone National Park and opened a lodge near the park's eastern boundary as well. Buffalo Bill admired the skill involved in being a cowboy. When he first started his show, cowboys were considered lowly second-class citizens. The Wild West used real cowboys and cowgirls recruited, recruited from ranches in the West. It promoted their skills and improved their image. Our modern image of the old Western cowboy is due in large part to Buffalo Bill's Wild West. The show demonstrated bronco riding, roping, and other skills. It was a forerunner of today's professional rodeo. Buffalo Bill became an advocate for the Indians. He had encountered them on a warrior to warrior basis during the Indian Wars and shared a mutual respect with them. Cody endorsed westward expansion and felt that the Indians had to make a way for civilization and get used to living with Western society. 
yet he had great sympathy for them. He wrote, the defeat of Custer was not a massacre. The Indians were being pursued by skilled fighters with orders to kill. For centuries, they had been hounded from the Atlantic to the Pacific and back again. They had their wives and little ones to protect, and they were fighting for their existence. Wild West show posters frequently portrayed the Indian as the American. And I just here, you see the little red dot there, you'll see the American underneath the, uh, the Indian in the center of that poster. Cody treated his former foes with great respect and dignity, giving them an opportunity to leave the reservation and represent their culture when many were trying to destroy it. This is one of my favorite Wild West posters. And once again, you see the Indian underneath the profile there, or the American, I should say, the American. He treated these former foes with great respect and dignity, giving them an opportunity to leave the reservation and represent their culture when many were trying to destroy it. There are some people who feel that Buffalo Bill's Wild West exploited the Indians. This insults the Indians who knew exactly what they were doing when they joined the Wild West. Not only did Buffalo Bill pay them well and treat them with respect, his Wild West offered the Lakota in particular and other tribes a chance to preserve a culture that was being destroyed back on the reservation. Here we see Luther standing there. After a first season with the Wild West in 1902 and 1903, Luther Standing Bear returned for the next season. He was to meet show representatives at Rushville, Nebraska, just south of the reservation in South Dakota. He wrote that, when I arrived there, I was surprised to see all the Indians from my reservation there waiting. They had a big camp. It seems they had found out in some manner that I was again to be in, again to be in charge. And when I entered the camp, I was besieged at all sides from those who wanted to go out with the show. There was a very large interest in being able to perform with some play, with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. When Standing Bear mentioned being in charge, incidentally, he was referring to being head of the Indian police with the show. The Indians in the show were self-policing. The policemen were selected by the Lakota performers from their ranks, then Buffalo Bill would select one of them to be the head of the police. During the Indian Wars, the saying was the only good Indian is a dead Indian. After the 1880s and the reservation period began, it became kill the Indian and save the man. This meant that the US government made major efforts to suppress and destroy the Lakota culture in particular. They did not practice physical genocide, but they did apply a kind of cultural genocide. Buffalo Bill's Wild West and other Wild West shows gave the Indians an opportunity to practice, preserve, and promote that culture, both here in the United States and in Europe. This hand-colored photo belonged to Buffalo Bill. You can see the Lakota performers proudly wearing their ancestral clothing, something they were not allowed to do on the reservation. Lakota warrior, warrior Blackheart, said, Blackheart said, we were raised on horseback. That is the way we had to work. These men furnished us the same work we were raised to. That is the reason we want to work for these kind of men. While Cody employed the Lakota, he also used his influence to arrange audiences between them and political leaders, including US presidents, when the show was in Washington. I go into a good deal of depth on those topics in my book, Lakota Performers in Europe. It's no longer in print, but you may be able to borrow it at one of the two libraries in town I mentioned, or it is available in electronic version on Amazon. Now a little bit about Buffalo Bill and women. Annie Oglu, who performed with the show from 1885 until 1901, adored Cody and considered him a perfect gentleman. The two of them disagreed on women's suffrage, however. Cody felt women should vote, Annie Oakley did not. Cody admired Susan B. Anthony, who he knew, and supported her efforts for women's suffrage. Cody not only supported women getting the vote, he spoke on behalf of other women's rights, including equal employment opportunity. In an 1898 interview, he stated, every year, every month, yes, every day, sees new fields opening up to women, and it does me good. I like to see them get out and hustle. 
These fellows who prate about the women taking their places make me laugh. If the women could get them, let them have them. They deserve what they get. Let the fellows get up and get something else to do. This is critical. If a woman could do the same work that a man can do and do it just as well, she should have the same pay. This is what Cody said 122 years ago, and there are still some guys who aren't as enlightened, enlightened as Cody was. Buffalo Bill also promoted the skills of various ethnic groups in the West. Rope tricks and riding by Mexican vaqueros were a feature of the Wild West. Note the words, Congress of Rough Riders of the World, up at the top of this poster. In 1893, he added that feature to the show with horsemen and horsewomen from all over the world. He first added Russian Cossacks, Gauchos, and Arabians to the vaqueros, then continued to expand over the never next years. The show grew to the point it had people from every continent in the world showing off their skills and ethnic traditions. I should say every continent with the exception of Antarctica. I often joke the, the penguins just had too tough a union to work with. But in any way, it's pretty impressive they had all those different people representing themselves and representing their peoples. In this photo, can be, photo can see, we can see people from Senegal, Eastern Europe, Argentina, Saudi Arabia. There's even an Aborigine there from Australia. He's holding his, his boomerang. The sight of so many different peoples from so many different uh, nations parading in the parades together, performing and eating together in Buffalo Bill's Wild West prompted one newspaper to observe it was, quote, the exemplification that in time, knowledge and acquaintance will dispel racial prejudices and national hatred and emphasize the fact of all mankind's kindredship. Buffalo Bill opened the first Mexican food restaurant east of the Mississippi in 1887 at Madison Square Garden in New York. This image is from a New York Sun article about its food. Note in the center, the word henchiladas on the menu. The writer observed that they looked like dainty crepes, but were something quite different. He said, a straw man born to the custom might learn to like the henchiladas. He felt the same about the mezcal served at the restaurant, which he said tasted like gin, gin, rum, and rhubarb combined, and in repeated doses had the power of all other intoxicants together. He concluded that no man can toy with it with impunity. Perhaps some of you too have been toyed with it and regretted having done so the next morning. Actually, I think the last time I had mezcal probably was in Durango. I'm currently working on a book entitled Galloping Gourmet, Eating and Drinking with Buffalo Bill. That will include more about the Mexican restaurant and other culinary aspects of Buffalo Bill's life and show. I also explore his own progression as a gourmet from eating hardtack and beans on a wagon train crossing the plains to eating at places like Delmonico's and the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. The staff of the show grew over time from 650 to close to 1500 persons. They all had to be fed for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. To do that, they created a 20 foot long range wagon, which you see here. It was an assemblage of several cooking ranges connected together and sharing a large smokestack venting the massive wood fire within. As many as eight cooks stood around it preparing, for example, 1,000 steaks and 3,000 eggs for every breakfast. When it traveled to Europe, the Wild West introduced the continent to corn in its various forms, including popcorn balls. A newspaper wire service in the United States declared, Buffalo Bill is teaching the French to eat popcorn. Here we see the show performing on the Champ de Mars with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Five years after the show's tour of Europe concluded, a writer remarked that it was Buffalo Bill's Wild West that first introduced the trendsetters of Europe to cornbread, corn cakes, and all that could be made of corn. He stated that Cody thus indirectly created a market for American corn, which has resulted in the sale of millions of bushels. He suggested that all other contributions that Cody made during those years of traveling in Europe paled in, co in comparison 
uh, to this particular contribution. There was another contribution though, that I'm not sure paled in comparison. The show itself also helped popularize American cocktails in England at the American exhibition, which was honoring the Jubilee of Queen Victoria in 1887. Up until that point, the American cocktail was not really used much in, in Europe at all. The Buffalo Bill uh, Wild West showgrounds were attached to the main exhibition, and here we see them constructing it at the beginning, uh, the beginning of their stand there. The show quickly overshadowed everything else at the exhibition. As people approached the show, they could stop for refreshments at a bar that was 700 feet long, and they were offered 400 different kinds of drinks. On this close-up of an 1887 map of the exhibition, you can see the passage they walked down. Uh, they passed a huge bar on their way into the arena. So they would come from the exhibition from the left here. See if I get the red thing. Yeah, coming in from the exhibition grounds and there's a passage there. They'd walk through the passage. As they walk, they passed the refreshment bars. 700 feet of them grabbed their drinks and then went into the grandstand. Cody hosted kings in Europe and political leaders in the US to meals at his show, as well as celebrities like Thomas Edison. He also held a special banquet for everyone in the show nearly every 4th of July, featuring such gourmet items as boiled sea bass and anchovy sauce, prime rib and duckling with currant jelly. Here the cast is enjoying one of those banquets. Buffalo Bill is in the front on your left. He's not wearing his hat. And you will note that it, it usually served to hide a rather bare spot on the top of his head there. I think we have the little red there just above. Um, interestingly enough though, most of the time when he posed for photos, that bare spot was covered by his hat. First and foremost, Buffalo Bill's Wild West offered people a glimpse of the American West. People of the time who knew the West, like Frederick Remington, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, praised the show for its accuracy. Mark Twain wrote Cody, I have now seen your Wild West show two days in succession, enjoyed it thoroughly. The show is genuine, cowboys, vaqueros, Indians, stagecoaches, costumes, the same as I saw on the frontier years ago. Mark Twain was not the only person who was impressed by Buffalo Bill's Wild West. A young uh, Winston Churchill, Churchill pestered his mother until she took him. Joseph Campbell's interest in myth was prompted by seeing the Indians in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Susan B. Anthony, who I've mentioned already of Buffalo Bill exchanged accolades during the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Gilbert and Sullivan, considered doing an operetta about the Wild West. And in fact, after attending the show, Puccini wrote an Italian opera called Girl of the Golden West. Bram Stoker based the Texan Quincy Morris in his novel Dracula on Buffalo Bill. Even artists were influenced by Buffalo Bill. James McNeil Whistler announced his intent to paint a portrait of Buffalo Bill, but I guess he never did that. He decided to paint his mother instead. Paul Gauguin went to see the show twice and was so excited by it that he bought a Stetson hat. This self-portrait, later done by Gauguin while he was in Tahiti, shows him wearing a hat that looks very much like Stetson's boss of the Plains hat. Possibly it's that same hat that he bought while he was in Paris. The Wild West was catapulted into worldwide prominence when it was invited to England in 1887, as I said earlier. It was the main American contribution to Vic Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee celebration. It was the hit of the celebration visited by nobility, commoners, and by Queen Victoria herself. The show was even credited with improving British and American relations. Buffalo Bill's Wild West then later toured the American continent. Well, after several seasons traveling across Europe, Buffalo Bill and his show returned to America in a I, I'm sorry, I said later toured the European continent. After leaving um, England, he went to the European continent. But after several seasons traveling across Europe, Buffalo Bill and his show returned to America in 1893. During most of that year, Buffalo Bill's Wild West played outside the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. 
He had originally asked to be part of the Midway, but the directors of the exposition did not approve of his allowing the, the Lakota to show off their culture and recreate battles. So they turned him down. Instead, he and his partners acquired land near a main railroad stop and opposite one of the main entrances to the exposition. So here we see Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Whoops. Here we go. Let's see if I can get that red dot. Oh, red dot isn't working. Well, you can see that for yourself. It was right outside the exposition and right next to the main train station. So when people came off uh, the train at the train station, they had a choice. They could um, go to one direction and enter the uh, Wild uh, West show or the other direction and enter the exposition. So it was a very advantageous spot compared to where they would have been uh, in the Midway. And here you actually see the, the first Ferris wheel that was in the Midway in 1893. And in the foreground, we see uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West. The show occupied 15 acres, had a grandstand that housed 18,000 people. Hey, they had two shows a day and played to record crowds. Four million people visited the show while it was in Chicago for seven months. The show toured Europe over the next 10 years following a rigorous schedule. Denver was a regular stop for the show. Other towns visited in Colorado were Boulder, Canyon City, Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, Grand Junction, Greeley, Leadville, Sterling, Trinidad, Pueblo, La Junta, and even Julesburg. But he never got to uh, Durango, unfortunately, probably because his show was transported on a standard gauge train rather than narrow gauge. During the 1896 season, the show traveled 10,000 miles with 132 stops. Each season usually lasted from April through October. Well, Buffalo Bill's restless and roaming spirit was ideal for life on the road with show business, but it was hard on family life for him to be gone for seven months of every year. During the winter season, when the show was closed, he returned to his home in North Platte, Nebraska, but even then was often away either hunting with friends or handling various business interests. And when he and his wife, Louisa, were together, they often argued. As you see from this, uh, this newspaper article, in 1904, he filed for divorce. Louisa contested it, and an acrimonious and embarrassing divorce trial was held. She accused him of having an affair with Queen Victoria even, and in response, Buffalo Bill accused her of trying to poison him. As you can imagine, each of these accusations were shown to be absurd, but they made for juicy headlines all over America. As this one says, we're liable to hear naughty things. Both bills carrying on with other women and drinking were brought up, interestingly enough, but actually neither carried much weight in the trial. But then I think they have been very much exaggerated over the years since he died. Buffalo Bill was handsome, famous, and rich, so women were attracted to him. And when you consider his home life was not all that good, there were temptations aplenty. But given all of that, there are only a few times may he, have, he may have actually succumbed to those temptations. As far as his drinking goes, like many other men on the frontier, he was a hard drinker. But when he started Buffalo Bill's Wild West, his agreement with his business partner, Nate Salisbury, was that he would not drink during the season. And he was fairly faithful to that agreement. Instead, he drank ginger ale, apple cider, and buttermilk. He was so faithful to the agreement that folks in Europe thought he was a temperance supporter. But the folks who believed that did not see him during the five months of the off season. Then he usually drank quite liberally with whiskey being his poison of choice. Although finally in 1905, he pretty much gave up drinking and kept to that until his death in 1917. After all of the testimony and the acrimony uh, and the, all of that, the judge denied the, the divorce. He chided Bill for wanting to discard, discard his wife after she, he, she had raised their children while he traveled all over the world. The two were not divorced, but they remained separated for the next five years. But they still had affection for each other and were reconciled in 1910. They grew close over the next seven years before his death. This uh, image shows them in an affectionate moment. 
Luis is now wearing Buffalo Bill's favorite watch fob on a necklace, on a necklace and he has hand, his hand gently placed on her shoulder. Well, that same year, 1910, the uh, Buffalo Bill formed a movie company in an effort to capitalize on the popularity of the new medium of film. He made a documentary movie about his life and another about the Indian Wars. These were sort of a bridge between what he had done with the recreation of battles of Western life in the Wild West and the, the first popular movie genre, the, the Western. And in fact, he helped make that so that the Western was one of the first popular movie genres. But movies did cut into Wild West show audiences. The shows began to become less popular in the 20th century. Buffalo Bill's Wild West came to an end in 1913. That year, Harry Tamman, excuse me, a Denver businessman seized Buffalo Bill's Wild West in payment of a debt. It was sold off at auction in Denver's Overland Park. For the next two years, Buffalo Bill appeared as part of Tamman's Sells Floto Circus. In 1916, Cody left the Sells Floto Circus and joined the 101 Ranch, Wild West. He still attracted crowds, but the 70-year-old Cody would often collapse of exhaustion after the show. When the 1916 season ended, Buffalo Bill caught a persistent cold. After four weeks, he traveled to Glenwood Springs to take in the waters. As you can see in this picture, this picture was one of the last taken of him. He was pretty emaciated and he did not improve. The doctor at Glenwood told him that he did not have long to live. He traveled to his sister's home in Denver where he spent his last days. Buffalo Bill has been painted many times. This is my favorite painting of him and it was reportedly his favorite as well. It shows him scouting on the plains, but I think it symbolizes much more. When he died, one newspaper observed, there was but one Buffalo Bill, the living symbol of the great West that was. But Buffalo Bill wanted to be remember, remembered as more than that. He wanted to be seen as helping create the great West as it would become, and he did. He was someone who had a role in settling the West, then took part in shaping our vision of the West. He was a visionary who promoted such innovations as the rodeo and movies. He even introduced culinary innovations. He spoke out for women's rights, preservation of nature, ethnic harmony, and rights of the Indians. When I look at this painting, I see a man not just scouting on the plains, but scouting out the future. Thank you. So I think we can move into Q&A. This is often my favorite time. So I hope you have some questions that we can get into. Thank you, Steve. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So um, let me see. So what we have right here is, um, do you believe that Buffalo Bill's Wild West helped spread the false narrative of the Wild West being a place of whiteness? Uh, the glory of the days in the Wild West often mis mis oh, misleads one to believe that the US frontier was an easy place to live. So. I, I'm not sure one could say that about the Wild West and what it ha what happened in it, because he really, a lot of the show, he did do the reenactments of battles. And unfortunately, if you will, according at least the way the Lakota felt, they always had to lose the battles. But they showed the battles in, in rather striking detail. And it was, it was something that I think people looked at and said, wow, that must have been kind of hard for people. But another thing he did was he was very attentive to showing the life of the Lakota in particular. And he would have them set up their teepees. They would be there with their whole family. They would demonstrate how to set up a teepee in the arena. But outside of the arena, it was possible then to walk around uh, to the different teepees and meet the, the families. And so the performers are there with their families, they would meet their children. And it was very important to people to see that. And they got introduced to the life and, and the life that the Indians were leading and had led, but which they were being prevented from leading 
on the reservation. So that's why I say Buffalo Bill was actually an advocate for preserving their culture in what he did. But at the same time, the shows were a part of that time in the sense that he showed life in the West as being rather exciting. Quite frankly, the real life in the West was probably more personified by a woman going slowly mad in a sod house in Western Kansas because there was nothing to do for days on end and at least her husband was out working in the fields. That was it. There was a lot of boring times that happened in the West. In fact, if you were working in one of the forts, your life was a life of boredom punctuated by periods of sheer terror when you had to go out and possibly confront uh, uh, the Indian, uh, uh, the Indian warriors. So I think Buffalo Bill, yes, he was showing a life that was a little bit of show business, but for the most part, I think he was showing a fairly truthful life. Now, later on, when you start seeing things done in the movies, I think some of that gets a little bit distorted. Does that, does that work? As an answer? Um, I mean, hopefully. Um, hey, that other, answered it is what I mean, yes. <laughs> another question. Um, wasn't there controversy surrounding his burial? Yes, there was, in fact. Uh, after he died, his wife announced that he had asked to be buried on Lookout Mountain, at which point folks in Cody, Wyoming said, wait a minute, he helped found our town. And uh, back in 1906, he had said he wanted to be buried here. Well, at that point, uh, Louisa produced a will that he had written in 1913 that said he wanted uh, her to make the decision as to where he was uh, asking to be buried. And he had told her on his deathbed he wanted to be buried on Lookout Mountain. Uh, that did not satisfy the folks in Cody, even though uh, the Park County Court uh, did prove that that was the current will and therefore what it said had to be followed. Um, one of the things that happened was Cody had a niece uh, she had kind of taken advantage of her relationship to Cody over the years for her own self-promotion, if you will. And um, when um, he got buried on Lookout Mountain, at first she thought that was okay. She did not get along well with Louisa and was kind of unhappy when the Cody's reconciled. So uh, initially she thought that it was okay that Buffalo Bill was buried on Lookout Mountain. However, she got into a spat with Mrs. Cody and Mrs. Cody, four years after Buffalo Bill died, was buried right next to him on Lookout Mountain. At which point, uh, this woman, Mary Jester Allen, changed her attitude completely and led the cause of taking Buffalo Bill back to Cody, where, quote unquote, he said he really wanted to be buried. And uh, that kind of started this controversy in the early 1920s. And uh, even in 1927, Johnny Baker, who was Buffalo Bill's foster son and started the museum up on Lookout Mountain, decided this has just gone on too far. So he actually had both uh, Buffalo Bill and Cody exhumed, their, their caskets exhumed, put them side by side because Mrs. Cody had been buried on top of him, on top of uh, Buffalo Bill, and had them put side by side and then put 11 tons of concrete over the grave as he said, as Johnny Baker said, to settle the issue once and for all. He's there, he's staying there. So you folks in Cody just gonna have to get over it. So we still have, today our relationship, for example, with the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, the relationship of the museum on lookout with them is actually a very good one. We cooperate and help each other out. Uh, actually, I'm working as a volunteer with both places now. Um, but it's kind of a good natured ribbing that we put each other through every so often. So uh, they say, oh, you know, he really wanted to be buried here. And my reply used to be, well, he's buried here and it's exactly where he wanted to be. So it's kind of fun to play with that actually. It, it's good for publicity. Controversy always helps publicity. <laughs> um, so I have another question for you, Steve. Um, you showed Indians in an image where they look like they had painted their bodies. Can you yes. talk about that? Yes, they did uh, paint their bodies uh, and that was very much a tradition. Uh, that was part of the culture that they followed. I did not show this, uh, but there's an image by an artist uh, of, of the backstage uh, of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. It's a wonderful graphic and it shows them actually painting their bodies and helping each other get ready to go out and perform. And of course, uh, what you saw was a, uh, 
colorized version. So an artist later on uh, tried to replicate the paint colors on, on, the, on the Indians' bodies. But this was very much a part of what they did. And it was something that really angered the Indian agents in Pine Ridge in particular, because they were trying to keep them from doing that. And then they went to Buffalo Bill's Wild West and he not only allowed them, but encouraged them to do that and to don all of the other aspects of the clothing that they had worn back before the reservation days. Yeah. Um, so another question here, how did Buffalo Bill treat Sitting Bull? What did he think about his death? Well, Buffalo Bill and Sitting Bull had an interesting relationship. Uh, Sitting Bull was with the show for four months in 1885. And um, Buffalo Bill uh, later on said, you know, he felt Sitting Bull was a great patriot for his people. And he actually spoke very good things about Sitting Bull, although occasionally, as often happens with friends, he got a little annoyed with Sitting Bull as well. We, uh, there's a wonderful photograph of Buffalo Bill and Sitting Bull standing with each other during the time they performed together. Now, what happened was because of this kind of friendship, during the ghost dance in 1890, uh, or was it 89, the ghost dance rises up amongst many of the different tribes in the West. It's particularly strong among the Lakota. And uh, the Indian agent where Sitting Bull is at, at uh, Standing Rock Reservation, is afraid that um, Sitting Bull is encouraging the ghost dance and wow. causing trouble up there. Well, he talks to General Nelson Miles, who's a friend of Buffalo Bill's, and Buffalo Bill had actually scouted for him. Nelson Miles asked Buffalo Bill, since he knew Sitting Bull, to go to Standing Rock to uh, where uh, Sitting Bull and his, his followers were living and uh, bring him in uh, to General Miles. It wasn't really an arrest, but it was kind of an arrest. Well, Buffalo Bill, knowing Sitting Bull liked hard candy, got a good deal of hard candy and other gifts to take to Sitting Bull, as well as a mutual friend or two, and um, got them in a wagon and started heading up to Standing Rock. The Indian agent up at the reservation, though, decided he wanted to do it his way, and he prevented Buffalo Bill from getting there. Wow. Uh, what happened is the Indian agent then sent in the Indian police, and there was conflict within the tribe between the Indian police and some of the people who were trying to work with the Indian agent and Sitting Bull and his followers. And what happened was a misunderstanding broke out. And in the midst of that, basically the Indian police shot and killed Sitting Bull. A few of their people also died. And it was, it was really kind of a very sad situation that I think, and other people have said the same, that if, if Buffalo Bill had been allowed to bring in Sitting Bull, that it would have been much more peaceful. Um, so that's kind of that story. Uh, Buffalo Bill was there at sitting, uh, almost there at Sitting Bull's end. And uh, he, he might have made a difference, but it's the way it was. Sitting Bull had had a vision uh, not long before he was killed, that he would be killed by his own people. And that vision was fulfilled. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your forthcoming book? Um, sure. Galloping well, Gourmet? Well, I gave you a little sample of it. Um, basically, you know, Buffalo Bill is, um, he grows up in Kansas in Leavenworth, and uh, they have a farm. Uh, one of the interesting little stories is that uh, on their farm, they had what they called yellow leg chickens. Now, in those days, you didn't talk about chicken breeds, you talked about the colors of their legs, which signified they were different breeds. But there were yellow leg chickens, blue leg chickens, red leg chickens, and white leg chickens at the time. But yellow leg chickens were considered uh, some of the fattest, the plumpest, and they took good, good care of themselves too. Uh, so they could wander around pretty wild and eat lots of grubs and insects and, and fend for themselves. So the Cody family had yellow leg chickens, and it was a practice in those days that when the circuit riding Methodist ministers uh, drove around and went to different homes to preach, because they didn't have churches, they would go to preach in the homes, and most frequently they were served yellow leg chickens of all things. It even became a joke at the time about how when a, 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 a Methodist minister would ride by a farm, all the yellow leg chickens would go run for hiding. Uh, they were even talking about a local Methodist uh, university or a Methodist um, seminary uh, in Kansas. And at that Methodist seminary, 
they uh, said they were uh, jokingly, they said, well, they're also going to tell not only about how to teach the Bible, but also how to raise yellow leg chickens. They were so associated in people's mind with Methodists. So getting back to Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill really got bored, did not like it when the Methodist ministers came to the house and preached on and on and on for hours. So he and his dog would often go out and try and chase the yellow leg chickens away when they heard the Methodist minister was coming so they wouldn't have to go through that. This is an opening story. I have many more stories uh, that go into it uh, about him eating with all sorts of famous people. He had a breakfast in Paris. He served breakfast, a special breakfast to uh, Thomas Edison, uh, which Thomas Edison said was the best food he had while he was in Paris. I don't think Frank, the French would like to hear that, but it was usually American food. He also did these rib roasts. The Indians would prepare a big old oxen rib or a large cow, uh, bull rib and, and cook it over a file fire. And they would present it to everybody and they had to eat it with their hands. And they would bring in these dignitaries, these princes, these uh, reporters, those folks would be forced to eat meat with their hands. So there's all sorts of stories like that that I'm rolling into it. I could go on way too long because it's a pretty, going to be a pretty extensive book. I don't know if that's the preview where you're looking, you were looking for, but there's a little bit there. Great. Um, so another question here. Uh, we've got a couple of different comments, but this is another question. Um, was the competition between the 101 Ranch show with the Miller Brothers and the Wild West show friendly? Uh, my grandfather worked with the 101 uh, Ranch as a bad guy because he could rise and shoot at the same time. <laughs> or okay. ride, it looks like ride and shoot. Ride, ride and shoot at the same time. That's great. <laughs> well, that's really great. Yeah, the, there's a wonderful book written about the 101 Ranch. Um, and now I can't remember the name of it since I brought it up, but you can look it up on Google. Um, I can't remember the name or the guy that wrote it, but at Was any it Michael rate, Wallace? Michael Wallace, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, Michael Wallace, you may have that book then, huh? Yeah, I have that one. So. Yeah, it's a very good book. But there really was uh, not a lot of competition because uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West was sort of the first of the Wild West shows. By the time the 101 Ranch got really going, there was some competition, but they were all kind of, you know, he was well established, Buffalo Bill was. Uh, what happened was uh, he did have some competition from Pawnee Bill, Doc Carver, and some other people at the early years. Pawnee Bill had actually learned how to do the Wild West uh, by working for Buffalo Bill and then opened up his own Wild West show. Uh, so there was competition there. Uh, and as I said, movies provided a new competition after the turn of the century. So all of these different Wild West shows were providing you know, they were competing with each other and with the wild, with uh, uh, Western movies. So it got a little slim for all of them. Buffalo Bill actually at one point combined with Pawnee Bill in 1909 uh, so that they could combine their shows and they wouldn't compete with each other. Um, well, the 101 Ranch never combined with Buffalo Bill, but by the time they really got going, Buffalo Bill's show uh, ended in 1913. Pawnee, uh, the uh, 101 Ranch, I think really starts taking off. Uh, in the latter part of this century and then into the 1920s. And so when Buffalo Bill was out, able to get out from under the contract with Swell, Sells Floto, he was pleased to join the 101 Ranch. And so he had known them and it was an amicable combination for him. Unfortunately, one that he only enjoyed for a year before he died. So I have another, another question um, and I'll try and reframe this a little bit. Um, in terms of kind of the, the friction or dichotomy of basically Buffalo Bill's intentions of preserving indigenous culture while at the same time kind of mythologizing it, um, I think is a way I might be able to frame this. This is kind of coming from a couple of different people and different perspectives. Does respecting in the indigenous cultures um, also entail profiting from their cultural practices, I guess is kind of like Buffalo Bill's making money off of the show, but in the bottom line, how much is he really paying the performers in terms of, you know, I mean, he's- He paid them quite well. He paid the Indians quite well. And that was one of the reasons so many of them were waiting in Nebraska, uh, 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 Nebraska to join the show if they could uh, when, uh, 
uh, uh, Luther saw them there, uh, Luther standing there. So the, it was a very desirable thing to work, not only with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, but with all the other, other Wild West shows who would go and recruit at Pine Ridge. And they paid them quite well. So it was a desirable opportunity. And I think that's what people sometimes forget. Buffalo Bill, yes, he was a businessman. He made money, but he paid his people well. They liked working for him. They had a great deal of loyalty to him. Now, the question really is, is being employed exploitation? If that is the case, I think a lot of us were exploited through most of our lives. Some of you still are being exploited out there. So I think there's a tendency to overthink this in some ways. Uh, but for the, for the Indians at that time, this was a wonderful opportunity to get off the reservations. As far as the mythologizing goes, mythologizing is part of everything. It's what people do. It's part of how we order our lives and approach them. The mythologies, for example, that we see in England were important to them over the years. Then you come to the United States and they even transferred some of those mythologies to the American West where they draw, uh, I've seen places where they drew um, connections between Buffalo Bill and Robin Hood. And in fact, he even had a show that he did for a while on stage called Buffalo Bill, Night of the Plains. He was well aware that he was part of a myth-making period in America's history. He didn't have a problem with that, and I quite frankly don't either. The Indians were rolled into that and were a part of that myth. It was not an abuse of them. In some cases it was, but in the case of the Wild West shows, it was anything but abuse of the Indians. Yeah, and I think that kind of covered um, some of what this other um, uh, person had been questioning um, as well, as far as kind of how, um, you know, oral, uh, uh, oral narratives of the Lakota perspective come into play, um, especially in today with, with, you know, current historians and so on. Um, and looking at, at this past history, so. Well, Good. and some, some of the people are confused. I'll be frank. There's, there's too many Lakota that don't know much of their own history to look at that. And I think they're also who maybe ha need to have a little more respect for their elders. And I'm gonna say that because I myself know that in terms of my own culture and where I grew up. I started out as an American folklorist and I was interested in myth and storytelling and all those wonderful things that make life so rich for all of our cultures. And so for me, one of the concerns I have is that there's been sort of a re-examination and I'm not sure it's always accurate in the way they've looked at the way folks in the past looked at their lives. Um, Vine Deloria Jr. was a good friend of mine and Vine Deloria was very much an admirer of Buffalo Bill. Yet at the same time, he lambasted Custer and he's the one that wrote the book, Custer, what did he write? Custer died for your sins. Yeah. So, so Vine Deloria saw something in Buffalo Bill and what he did for the Indians. Later on, uh, you see uh, Indian actors saying things like, because of Buffalo Bill, we had an opportunity. And there was an Indian actors guild that came out in the 1920s, 1930s. And Luther Standing Bear was part of that group, helped start that. And they were advocating and saying, don't be hiring white people to play us, hire Indians. We're here to do this for you. Now today we're fortunate that we have Graham Greene, well, we don't, I don't think we have him anymore. Wes Studi, uh -huh. people like that, who are able to perform. In many ways, the road was paved by people like Luther Standing Bear and people like Buffalo Bill for people like West Duty. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. I have one more question that I'm gonna answer when we, um, um, your screen, we'll take your screen down and I'll put mine up and then I can answer that uh, last question because it really pertains more to the Center of Southwest Studies. So let I me- I think I've stopped my screen, haven't I? You did, and Good. I will try and get mine back up and get to the next one. There we go. Um, so the last, uh, the last question that we had was um, if the re if this was recorded, 
and if so, where it's going to be available. And yes, um, this program was recorded and it will, um, it will be coming up on our uh, si Center of Southwest Studies YouTube channel. So you'll be able to see it on our YouTube channel. Um, it'll give us, give us a, about a week before we um, can get it uh, transferred over and get it up on our YouTube site, but it will be there. And um, I think I might go back and listen to it again. It was really fabulous. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank it's great you, to talk you. about one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to, to seeing your new book. This is going to be fun. Um, hopefully there's some good recipes in there we can try. <laughs> I, I have an appendix that'll have, if, if I can work with a publisher that'll let me do it, about 50 recipes. Oh, that'd be great. That will be great. Yeah, sounds good. Well, I just want to um, thank everyone for joining us today. Our next program is coming up on Wednesday, November 4th. It'll be at 6 o'clock p.m. And it's exciting. It's, um, it's going to be a roundtable with some of our artists that are in our current pivot uh, skateboard deck art exhibit that's at the Center of Southwest Studies. Uh, it's a fabulous exhibit. Um, hopefully you can uh, come and see it and make an appointment to come and see it. It is open and it is fabulous. We have 114 skateboard decks painted by 30 different Native American artists, and it is just fabulous. So hopefully we'll see you um, on Wednesday, November 4th at six o'clock. And um, there's information on how to go on our website to register for that event. And um, I just wanna close with thanking everyone for joining us tonight and um, have a great couple of weeks and we'll see you hopefully um, for this next uh, program. Take care and stay safe and stay strong during this kind of crazy COVID-19 time. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you.